Today, we are discussing The Last of Us Jr. Listen, kid, I think you'd be more comfortable over at that place. All the other kids with the pumped up appetites. Won't somebody please think of the children? There's no way in hell that a little girl caught up to a cat she saw wandering around, because I've tried catching stray cats all the time, and those cute little bastards never let me hold them, and that especially wouldn't happen for somebody growling and trying to eat them. You've got red on you. She might be alive at the end, but what is she gonna eat and drink for the rest of time? Kids are indeed the future. Spore more years! Spore more years! Britain makes good zombie movies. I don't want you for your body. I want you for your brains. Um, actually, in the book, it's explained better. Why didn't you read the book? And the clickbaiting zombie kids and a thumbnail works really well for the YouTube algorithm movie itself. This time around, we are discussing why you wouldn't survive the girl with all the gifts. Hungary's zombie apocalypse. In the not-so-distant future, a parasitic fungus has infected a majority of the world's human population, invading their brains and converting them into zombies, or infected, or just flesh-craving, star-craving, mind-enslaving, teeth-engraving, hunger-saving, teeth-gyrating, morally depraving mushroom maniacs. Much like the cordyceps brain infection that dominated the world of The Last of Us, a fungal spore that targets colonies of ants in tropical forests in order to overtake their nervous system and position them in places that will allow the fungal parasites to spread easily easily to new hosts. This is the real world ramifications. However, while never fully explained, how did the cordyceps infect the human populace across the globe in The Girl with All the Gifts? Now, it's possible that the exclusivity deal that the ant species signed with the cordyceps contract expired, possibly due to indigenous tribes consuming these ants directly or by harvesting food and crops from tainted plants, soil, or even animals that ate these ants directly, or even animals that ate these ants and asymptomatically harbored the fungi, causing it to mutate and discover a viable host within humans. If you remember in my Last of Us video, I proposed the idea that the fungus attached itself to cocoa plants that would find their way to being consumed by a large portion of humanity. It's also very possible current medical experts could have sought to synthesize the fungus to work as a net gain for humanity, but much like the reprogrammed measles cancer cure in I Am Legend, the good intentions of a few spread into a horrible pandemic that encompassed the world. Regardless, this mind-altering fungus spread like wildfire. And and had humanity on its knees in just over a decade's time, forcing many to live in bunkers and struggle to survive and hope to find a cure. But what does this fungus do to humans that makes it so deadly in the first place? It is shown that the parasite can invade the nervous system through bodily fluids like saliva or blood, much like a majority of zombie apocalypse scenarios. A bite from an infected individual can cause you to turn into what are referred to as hungries within a short enough time span of even 30 seconds. The pathogen slash fungus already having experience in the structure of Homo sapiens will easily travel through the bloodstream and infect the gray matter to swiftly take hold. Motor control will be seized, causing sporadic disjointed movements across all limbs. The behaviors of infected persons will change instantly and voraciously as the cordyceps has reprogrammed their brain to endlessly crave the flesh and blood of other humans and animals not afflicted with the hungry's infection. Sorry vegans, you're going to be switching teams whether you like it or not, and attack any non-infected people and animals, only being satiated temporarily whilst they are devouring a victim's meat and lapping up their blood. From initial exposure to the fungus being among us in our blood and to our gray matter, within the first few days, weeks, and even months, we will just be a generic zombie archetype, with teeth chattering and roaming the planet for the next meal. Over time, though, the cordyceps brain infection will begin to consume and deteriorate the frontal lobe, effectively extinguishing everything that made us what we are. Remnants of our past selves can still linger in very faint regards, like former mothers pushing strollers or hungries gathering in social centers like cities and malls. The fungus will eventually pierce through the skull and begin to amass fungal growths around the cranium and throughout the body, possibly to either make any damage done to their growths, to release spores to infect others, or to just release spores in general over time because they're preparing the body to become a biomass to be utilized by the fungus. Now, much like any zombie-like apocalypse, I have to reiterate the like there because a lot of people didn't realize that I called the Dark 
Shark Seekers, Zompires in my recent video because of the genre these kinds of movies find themselves in. But these infected are not walking corpses that can live indefinitely like something out of a Romero or Walking Dead universe. These hosts are living in a one-sided symbiotic relationship, and the fungus within them, unlike the real-world cordyceps that destroys the host body to spread spores as fast as possible, it will instead, in this case, work as hard as possible to ensure the body can survive as long as possible. The body will need all organs functioning and together in order to operate, and enough damage to it will cause it to die. Although sufficient damage to major organs will take longer to kill the infected as they are purely running on constant adrenaline if hunting a target, not really feeling any pain, meaning it's quicker to resort to the tried and true shot or trauma to the head. These bodies are not decaying and do not undergo rigor mortis so they can achieve a full sprint after you if the host body detects a susceptible meal. Knowing the body needs, well, nourishment to survive, the fungus will force the idea to eat the flesh of others, and it works in tandem for the two, the body and the fungus, because the fungus gets to spread further and the basically unconscious human body gets to have some sort of sustenance for its gullet in order to keep on functioning. However, as time goes on, their food supply will begin to dwindle further and further. If you're constantly making zombies that you can't eat, well, you're not going to really have anything to keep on dining upon. To preserve the body in which it has taken hostage, the fungus will force this body to enter a semi-hibernative state, seemingly sleeping while standing up to conserve as much energy as possible while also standing in sunlight to at least take in that vitamin D. <laughs> But we aren't plants, so we aren't going to be photosynthesizing any kind of decent energy from sun exposure. Photosynthesis! Photosynthesis! Wanna go to the park? Hungries will tend to culminate in large groups as hordes, not only as a means to hunt as a pack in a veritable hive mind state to outnumber uninfected people, but also to make sure once these host bodies have died off, that the fungus can utilize the entirety of the body to act as organic mass to allow the fungus to grow outwards into nearby surfaces, much like The Last of Us's infection over time will do to dead bodies that calcify onto walls and eventually, while not discussed or really shown too much in the film, we get some hints here and there, spread deadly spores into the air that can be breathed in by non-infected people. So it's safe to say a fungus creating stalks and fungal structures like this could easily lead to spores being carried through the air to infect any people that had been able to hold out from being bitten or exposed to bodily fluids for all this time. In the meantime, while the fungus is making itself into a flood shallow grave mind or necromorph mini moon, the legions of the non dead will be working overtime in more ways than one, adapting and culminating the best they can with humanity's intelligence and senses. Hungries will have their senses of smell drastically increased, while their eyesight is hampered due to the fungi's effects on specific parts of the brain. Being able to discern the distinct minute smells of a cordyceps-ridden body over a non-infected host, whose sweat glands and more distinctly saliva can produce an odor that will not only draw the attention of the hungries, but also also spark their voracious namesake and actively make them start hunting, salivating, and trying to eat, especially with the next generation of fungal children. Generational gaps will exist. To any children born or harbored within women infected by the cordyceps, the neonatal fetuses or infants will begin to consume the flesh of the mother in order to survive and learn to thrive on its own like most animals born into their environment within a short amount of time. However, these infants born from infected parental hosts will have developed a very differentiated form of a symbiotic relationship with the fungus. Instead of having their consciousness completely eradicated by the cordyceps, the children hosts will retain a large modicum of their intelligence, being able to communicate, read, write, solve complex problems, basically anything a human being can do. The half-hungries will still contain the fungus, and whenever a tantalizing enough sight or especially odor reaches them, or if they are threatened in any way, 
will the cordyceps override all logic and reason? Turning the half-hungries absolutely feral and clanging their teeth uncontrollably, they will animalistically attack whatever person or creature has piqued their salivatory interests or invoked their fight or flight response until their belly has been filled or the threat has been neutralized. Although we see the perspective of the students as they are kept strapped down under the instruction of military and science individuals, a majority of the half-hungries will be born and develop in the wilds of the new world, not holding any connection to the non-spore-ridden people of the old world. Half-hungries not being targeted whatsoever by the mindless, fully infected people due to their retained cordyceps, the half-hungries can wander the world without worrying about being eaten alive, much like the hambies of All of Us Are Dead. Not only that, but using their problem-solving and higher intellect to fashion weapons and coordinate with other half-breeds and systematically hunt down any non-infected people and animals to eat and infect to a much more efficient scale, more so than their infected adult counterparts that keep that cordyceps in their brain straight 100%. Now these half hambies can use their harbored infection to their deadly advantage. They can buy any healthy people in a flash to make any deadly threat to their survival into a pacified, mindless drone that they can use for numerous gun fodder. And if you think about it, they would be able to soak projectiles like bullets and arrows and dunk weapons in their own bodily fluids like poop and spit and blood and just anything that comes out of the body to easily spread the fungus and turn non-infected people in seconds from far away, pretty much neutralizing any pure human threats to their survival. With this new generation of zombies that, by the end of The Girl with All the Gifts, see the extinction of humanity being a necessary step in the species' total evolution. This batch of highly intelligent half-breed children and teenagers will soon become fully grown adults that will actively turn any remaining pure-blooded humans into fully infected, and then watch them slowly die off as their flesh culminates in giant overgrown fungal masses, creating a landscape suited to this new species' ambience and needs. They will continue to produce while humanity has been wiped out. So, if that description of the Hungry's fungal infection didn't quite change your mind on you thinking you could survive, let's just go over the dead facts and see why you'd be deader than a person commenting, I'm just built different. And believe me, I've seen a lot of those over the last two and a half years. Do people really comment this this often? Oh my god. All of the 28 Days Later video, wow. Look how many people put it! Who's the original person? So it was the Fallout video. Bing bong baller, you're the first one. Good job, buddy. By the way, big shout out to Roanoke as I've been on a bit of a time crunch trying to figure some stuff out in life and his video on the Hungry's infection really helped shape this video up and I gotta give credit where credit is due with his big science brain. Also shout out to Wisefish for editing this together, the handsome lad that he is. Now if the fungal infection were to sporadically pop up in a decent amount of our food supply across the world, many people would become holding cells for a small amount of the fungal spores that may have survived through the cooking and preparation processes, allowing it to lie dormant within our bodies or at least not show any noticeable symptoms in its hosts while its infected numbers spread and accumulated. It's also possible through clinical testing trials that the cordyceps were to leap species and take hold of hosts, just like the Crippen virus, in a short amount of time. Many would be afflicted and turned within a few weeks, causing sudden chaos, rioting, and martial law to take effect as these violent individuals would spread the infection. Think 28 days later in its opening stages. Any drop of blood or saliva that enters your body in any way, shape, or form could have you turning in no time. Over time, the turn rate for the fungus in human hosts will begin to shorten more and more as each victim will allow the morphology of the fungus's familiarity with the human anatomy, allowing it to more easily travel through the bloodstream to our gray matter and take control of the frontal lobe. A disease this 
easily spreadable and causing frenzied people to attack others would basically have the public in mass confusion, thinking it's just a few crazy people running amok as they bite their way to higher infected numbers. A lot of people wouldn't take this as a medical emergency in any way, they wouldn't see this as a pandemic, more as just rioting. Armed forces attempting to subdue these infected would become, they themselves, succumbed to the fungus. The swiftness of the cordyceps in this scenario would be too much to handle in its infection rate as the world plummets. You would have to be lucky enough not to consume tainted food or possibly even water, nor be a part of anything containing the fungus medically or nutritionally, while also finding yourself in a location that won't have a huge populace of people turning and attacking others as thick population density areas will become hotspots for the hungries. You, if you're going to be in a really highly populated area, I don't see you really making it. And also for you to be highly fortified and supplied enough to attempt to outlast any infected over the course of a few weeks that are outside to hopefully let them die out from starvation, malnutrition, dehydration, and exhaustion. But that would be only for their dead bodies to provide an even worse threat to your survival and everyone else's later on. The only real way of preventing this outbreak from strangling humanity's dominance in the global food chain would be to literally burn any living thing, object, or food harboring its spores and utterly destroying it. But if this were to spread as quickly as it is assumed to have been, it would be a measure that would be executed way too late as public outcries of morality of burning the infected and destroying so much would have things slowed down immensely. The only scenario I see playing out that would really keep humanity at the top of the food chain, again, would be similar to 28 weeks later, where the infected populace dies out in the first month without gaining further numbers while not being able to find other humans or animals to eat for sustenance. Remember, in 28 days later, they don't really eat, so that's why they die out so quickly. In this scenario, they do cannibalize others to keep themselves moving, so their food supply would have to be cut pretty quick. But this would also have to be before the cordyceps repurposes their decaying biomass for the fungus to grow and attach to surfaces to possibly start producing spores to make this fungus airborne and breathable. So remaining survivors would have to focus their efforts on setting these fungal growths ablaze before airborne particles can be mass produced. But you know what, it's a why you wouldn't survive scenario, so let's say this does not play out that way and you are within your home, work, or other place of survival with other survivors months in with no slowing down of the infection and the amount of people that are turning. You will again need non-tainted food supplies, a decent enough compound that can't be overwhelmed in an instant away from prying eyes and teeth, and you'll have to have the sanity and know-how to stay put and know when and where to scavenge for the supplies. Learning how the hungries work and how the fungus works in the beginning is crucial. Putting on any attire to prevent being bitten easily and any eye and mouth coverings to not allow liquids to enter your orifices, but also to mask your scent to not easily be detected by the exacerbated sense of smell of the hungries and to not make any distinguishable loud noises to attract them from far away. They do have a moderate sense of hearing, meaning limiting your gunfire by having to execute small numbers of the infected at close range and risking a lot by not having to execute small numbers of the infected with guns, relying on using guns if there's a hordes fastly approaching. You would have to risk a lot by quietly killing them in close quarters combat with any melee weapons you can procure for a quick slaughter. You would have to know to aim for the head more than anything and maintain good enough energy and stamina to keep attacking the top part of the body, which is not going to be easily doable for some people, as a lot of people will go for crucial parts of the body that would heavily injure regular people, but not phase adrenaline-fueled fungus infected. Some people might aim for the torso or the legs, but they're just going to sit there and just... <laughs> So you gotta aim for the head. We're gonna be tiring ourselves out just knocking out two or three of the infected. A majority of us will probably be dead in the first few months not abiding by or knowing these rules of survival, especially in highly populated areas, leading to rural survivors having a bit of an advantage at the start. 
Time will not be on your side in these scenarios though, and to not sound redundant and repeating some points to extend the video's time or anything, that's not what I'm doing, but I have to fixate on certain things to get some people to fully understand that the longer this fungus is allowed to have majority control over the stock holdings of mankind, the worse it will be off for the minority of humans when it comes to the next generation and the fungus itself in and outside the body. The fungus will take its toll on the world, with the first being within the remaining and renewed fungal infected that will find ways to survive longer than any other infected living beings of other universes, even devouring their own flesh to the bone if necessary to keep the body alive and able to spread the infection. They will have the cordyceps hibernate the body when not needed and have hordes of them standing in a veritable stasis in groups to prevent any energy from being expunged unnecessarily. Meaning, if you're attempting to reach areas of safety or supplies, you're going to see a lot of them just kind of sitting there not moving and silence will be necessary in order to maneuver through them because they most likely have culminated in areas with decent amounts of supplies. Attempting to silently kill them as a healthy individual will most certainly cause enough noise to awaken one or more of them that will eventually awaken the entirety of the horde and spell your doom as dozens of hands and teeth rip you open giving you the most gruesome death possible. They will down any source of sound that makes them think a source of food is nearby. Even a dog scurrying away, and sorry to say they won't hesitate to eat cats and dogs. I really didn't like to see that in the movie, but that's kind of the realism of it. Although, Melanie was talking out loud on a walkie-talkie in front of a few hungries, and they didn't seem phased, which kind of breaks this rule, and if you want to see a zombie sense on this film, let me know down below, but let's just go off the fact that any kind of source of sound will break them out of their stasis. But no amount of silenced guns will stop them from being alerted because silencers don't work that way. Fungal growths will accumulate on the infected as discussed, some even having this fungal plating develop over their eyes and around their cranium, forcing them to rely on their hearing and smell more than anything, and could very well possibly lead to some infected becoming akin to The Last of Us's clickers. But not to as much of a deadly scale or damage-proof fungal plating or being able to one-shot you, but still the fungal growths basically are going to be kind of a detriment to their overall deadliness over time, but not to their longevity as a natural threat. Now children being born into the world as half-hungries would not be immediate knowledge. Pregnant women, as discussed by Dr. Carolyn Caldwell, were all probably unknowingly infected all at once, leading to possibly an idea of prenatal formulas carrying that aforementioned harbored ingredient of unintentional cordyceps, or just possibly that a bunch of pregos were bitten and they succumbed to the cordyceps infection. It's all hypothesis on the doctor's part. Once an embryo has been infected with the cordyceps, it would eat through the placenta and eventually eat its way out of their mother's insides in an extreme case of matrifagy. It's where the baby eats the mom after being born, but you know, it's not something I really want to think about. But until eventually hollowing out the mother's insides and erupting into the world. As they develop, they would seemingly just be abandoned or orphaned innocent children from the pandemic's chaos, considering children are something to be protected and not really seem as much of a threat. Survivor groups, militaries, and more would take in these toddlers, kids, and eventually preteens. With their guards completely dropped around these kids, any amount of saliva, blood, or other produced body liquids could easily trigger their hungry side, sending them into a blind, craving rage. Stopping at nothing, their teeth will chatter uncontrollably as the primal, fungal, overridden urge to bite will eventually cause them to sink their teeth into you and eating as much flesh as possible to quell their hunger and give the reproducing cordyceps in their brain another home to harbor in. Sleeper cell agents of infected could be in any child from here on out, causing paranoia in further pockets of men and women across the world to possibly all be turned in minutes due to just harboring one youngling. Many remaining survivors would fall victim to acting on their paternal instincts. Now efforts to use these children to work as agents for the preservation of humanity could crop up, 
much like in the movie. As seen in the film, incapacitated children are taught the history of man to give them moral human qualities and intellect and more, hopefully to maybe use as a distraction or as a non-detectable hybrid that could systematically take out infected one by one without retaliation, making sure their mind is not turning to the hungry side. But this would come with many necessary precautions, all while having to survive the zombie apocalypse outside, keeping them strapped down, making sure they can't bite anyone, and to prevent spurring the aforementioned cannibalistic episodes in the half hungries, you'll need to procure a steady supply of meat for the half hungries like maggots, worms, mammals, and birds to ensure they don't turn their hunger on you. You'll have to neutralize natural smells of sweat, saliva, and blood, simply masking one's natural musk with something like e-blocker gel would be advisable. However, looking through Amazon, all I could find was estrogen blocker, so I don't think that's going to be working anytime soon. So look for anything that can mask your scents so half-breeds can regain their scents. You could use mud or submerge yourself in water while also not being seen. It'd be the best course of action. But even then, any hungry children exposed to an environment with these distinct smells that mask these smells could easily become accustomed to connecting this masking smell to a human and be like, hey, I can hunt down this really foul smell of the e-blocker gel, and it would backfire. Now, if medical savants are available, they could also see to making vaccines based on the genome and immune system of the hungry children, but that's if they are around. However, it is going to be a pointless shot in the dark, as it will be ineffective as they will not be able to take the children's born response to react to the cordyceps in a symbiotic relationship within their body and try to replicate that into an injected adult. A miracle cure like that an idea like that is just not in the tarot cards of fungal fate. The only cure is death. And yes, that was a Left 4 Dead reference. But while efforts to cut them open and desperately try and stop this outbreak down to the molecular level will continue, hungry second generation children will eventually come together and fight back against this kind of treatment and emerge as primitive humans and hunt in herds to kill and devour survivors they have picked up the scent of using any tools they can procure with heightened durability to make them a force to be reckoned with for what few people could even see them coming as they assume the only threats are these mindless drones of the fully infected. They could also use these mindless drones of normal infected to their advantage, making as much noise as possible to draw in hordes to ensure any heavily armed survivors that could kill these kids are either overwhelmed by the infected or distracted long enough as they're fighting back for the kids to swiftly bite them and infect them and end them. They can ambush anyone in their groups and set traps for any living survivors, ambushing them from wherever they can be attacked. Any types of gas that would normally knock out a regular human being would simply not work on the half-hungries, as cordyceps metabolizes oxygen for the human host, making them not having to breathe as frequently as a normal human, possibly even meaning their capabilities to submerge underwater for long periods of time for waterborne ambushes is a possibility, and they could easily get to secluded islands or get to you as you're staying on a boat. They'll eventually lose their image of innocent children as they take on looks of primitive ragged cavemen communicating through screams and grunts, losing the humanity they once had. But their efficacy to murder and consume will not be deteriorated. Anyone that learns of the deadliness of these newly formed crotch goblins at this point will probably not have enough forces to take them all on effectively years down the line. Whether it's through sleeper cells of innocence or a primitive, cannibalistic reboot of humanity, these half-hungries will make sure their co-op partner of the cordyceps in their brain gets what it wants in the end, a fresh body to infect and eventually decompose with tons of other hungry hosts. The inevitable outcome of tons of infected gathering in large places to die and decay for its new cordyceps overlords, creating vine-like extensions of this fungus enough to even encroach skyscrapers and produce hardened sporangium seed pods that will eventually crack open, either through age or by exposure to extreme heat or cold, and burst their invasive spores into the air and glitter the world, making all oxygen on the planet now comprised of the fungus. 
fungus. In the end, this variant of the Cordyceps' brain infection can see to making its threat even larger even if its hosts live long, go dormant, and die. Unlike something like 28 Days Later or Left 4 Dead's Infected that will eventually all wither and die due to malnourishment and dehydration and the threat of the virus relying on fresh bodies to continue, the girl with all the gifts fungus can have a permanent vacation upon the world as long as the bodies they inhabit aren't burnt to ash as long as they're not able to culminate in these large biomasses that can create seed pods that will burst the spores into the air with extreme heat. For once, napalm strikes, I don't think are actually going to be working in the end game of one of these why you wouldn't survive scenarios. Napalm strikes would actually work in favor of the hungry fungal infection. You can survive, but as you bunker down and fight off however many infected may find you in your safe haven or during your scavenges, eventually either intelligent half-hungries will pry open your safe space and either infect you from afar or evade your offenses to become their next meal. Or simply you'll wait out your days hoping for a miracle until the very air you breathe will become your death warrant as your lungs intake the spores of the cordyceps and your existence is deleted. Your mind co-piloted and your hunger soon to be insatiable until your body cannot function and everything about you, your mind, your body, your very soul is harvested to ensure no living man, woman, and child can exist in this new world as the person they once were. It's over. It's all over. It's not over. It's, it's just not yours anymore. I don't want to end up like that. Please. Please. The last time. Last time I ever saw her. She was seven months. Beautiful. I had to hope her. She was out there. That's all for today. Thanks to my donators here and for you watching about me ramble about a fungus and its kids. Outros are short now because the YouTube algorithm favors watch time and you guys always click off during outros. So with that all said, stay happy, stay healthy, and never forget to stay wow, baby.